Um, so I'm Lucy Knight. I work for Devon County Council, but I also am one of the founder members of ODI Devon. So another node for the whole county of Devon. And as you can see, I like to keep things clear. There'll be no bullet points in my presentation because I'm just not grown up enough. It's going to be cartoons all the way. Um, and my thing is making data useful because um, I, how much of the audience today is local gov? Can you just raise your hands if you're local government? So fair representation. Okay, that's cool. We're all busy enough. We've got enough to do. So why would we bother with all this data stuff unless there's actually some point to it, something useful we can do with it? it we've got to make it work for us. Okay, so that's, that's the whole, you know, my whole reason for being here, my whole reason for doing what I do. Now, you'll notice that I very carefully avoided that splendid local government phrase and with my other hat on, because this is what we do. So, well, you know, I'm a project manager, but with my other hat on, I'm the chair of the preschool. With my other hat on, I'm community liaison. And we say that a lot, and we talk about changing hats as if it was as easy as that, as if it was some sort of quick change vaudeville thing, you know, across the stage like that. It's not that easy, is it? It's more like wearing one really big hat with like multiple sensor array, and you've got five radio channels coming in all at once. One of them's in Spanish. One of them's Eric Pickles yelling at you every six months. And it's not about changing your hat. It's not about magically stepping from one box to another, and that's all you have to worry about. It's more about you have to worry about all those things all at the same time, but sometimes you need to change your focus. You're the same person with the same concerns, but sometimes you have to stand in a different place and just look at what does it look like from here. So the whole hat thing is not really an accurate way to describe it. Now, in Devon, when we found that we were going to be losing the whole performance management, this is how you will report up, these are the things you'll report on, we started to work on a new uh, performance framework. And it's taken some time, but we think we're beginning to get there now. This is, this is what we do, this is useful for us, the information that we need, the things that we think we should be watching. We started off talking about levels. So we'll have strategic overview, and that's at the top, right and proper. And underneath that, you've got operational, and that's the next level down, and that feeds up to strategic, and that all seems to make sense. And then we thought, oh, we need a community level. So the community level, oh, oh, actually, that's where it all breaks down. Is community less important than operational? Is it at the bottom? Can't go above operational. That doesn't work either. But it's ridiculous to say that, for instance, an operational concern like ordering a new printer is more important than whether or not this community gets their bus route. And it's also ridiculous to say that something strategic like in 20 years time we might want to consider putting that, having that land put aside for a business park is more important right now than a seven-year-old in danger of harm or neglect. It's not about being more important, so it's not levels. It's not levels at all, it's lenses. It's about how you focus on the thing at hand. So this is what we're working with at the moment. As an analogy, we're really pleased with it because it makes sense when you look at it. Your strategic view is with the telescope. What's on the horizon? What's coming towards us that we need to be able to do something about when it reaches us? What's that big view like? Operational, that's focused down. How many paper clips? How many young people in danger? How many visits have we done? What difference are we making? What are the GCSE results like? So that's the day-to-day -day running of what we do and how well we're doing it. And communities, and this is where we really like the analogy, that's your wide-angle lens. That's actually, what's the big picture? If we do this over here, what happens over there? If we do something over there, what's that like for the people there? If we um, want to have 3,000 new jobs over here in 10 years' time, is it really helpful if we cut the bus route that would get people from there to there to take up those jobs, to start to think about the whole bigger picture. So this is something that we found really, really helpful to consider it in this way. So on to talking about communities. We talk about the community. The community wants this. The community needs that. As if it was some kind of entity with one set of views, one set of wants and wishes and needs. And that's very convenient because it's almost like listening to just one more voice. But the community <coughs> is made up of people. People have all sorts of things that they want and wish for and they need, and they pull in all sorts of directions. Do we always talk to the people with the biggest need, the, the people with the most important insight, or actually are we just talking to the people who get to us first and talk the loudest? So it is about working out who's in that community, or those several disparate communities, and what do they have to say, and where do their needs line up with ours? Um, and what can we do with them together? And what can we do with them in lots of different ways and different places rather than just saying, well, we talk to the community and this is what the community wants. We have to make sure this stuff makes sense. 
Now, the title of today is uh, Intelligent Towns. So, consummate professional I am. I worked it into the slideshow. What makes an intelligent town? I did, you know, didn't color this one in. That's how you can tell it was done in a hurry. Normally, it colors all over. But there you go. So, what's an intelligent town? I went and looked in the dictionary for some suitable words, picked the ones that fit with what I was going to say anyway. And so, I came up with three that I liked. Intelligence is, well, an intelligent entity is alert, it's informed, it's insightful. I like those three, they work for me. So being alert means that you've got an eye on what's coming up, what's about to happen, what does that mean, is that going to impact me somehow, do I need to worry about that? To be informed, like informed, well informed, I always thought meant that you take information from lots of different sources and you filter that and you choose and you make sure that you listen to points of view that don't necessarily reflect yours. So you're aware of what's coming in from all directions. You're not just in an echo chamber, but actually you're listening to all, everything that's coming in and deciding how that affects your view of things. And then insightful, to have insight, means you know what that all means. So that you look at everything that's coming in, you've got an eye on what's about to happen, and you understand what that means for you and what you need to do about it. Oh, excuse me, I'm going dry here. Is there any water? I forget to breathe and I forget to stop when I'm talking, so I always dry out about, about slide four, so yeah, there we are. So one of the tools that we're looking for to help us to be more intelligent, to have intelligent towns or smart cities, as the case may be, is open data. Um, you've heard a lot about open data today and you've heard some fantastic stories about things that people are doing, but the biggest thing about open data is the amount of hype around it. Now this beauty here, this is called the Gartner hype cycle. Anybody aware of Gartner? Any developers in the room, techie people? Yeah. So the hype cycle is usually applied to technology. So you get a new technology on the market, something really exciting, like the first ever capacitive touch screen or something like that. And that's the trigger, and people get so excited. And, oh, my word, it's going to be fantastic. It's going to change our lives. The robots are going to be doing my dishes. My, the entire universe is going to be changed as a result of this amazing new thing. And the expectations go up, and they go up, and they go up, and it gets very, very visible, and everyone is talking about it and how amazing it's going to be. Best Thank you. Very much. tap water, that's good. Fantastic. Oh, yes. You reach this peak, and then people begin to realize that actually some of that stuff sounds a bit unrealistic. And actually, I'm not seeing any sign of any of that happening. And the talk at the moment, I mean, that McKinsey report that got mentioned earlier, yeah, there's some really large numbers in there, billions, trillions of pounds to be generated. And that may well all be true. But to the average person working in the council and worrying about getting a couple of data sets out, it's not very meaningful, and it's not very helpful, not very motivating. So actually, about that point, expectations start to slide down again, and we start to go, yeah, well, it's all right, isn't it? But it doesn't really apply to me. It doesn't really help me. We get into a bit of a trough. And about the time that I drew this, I thought that that's roughly where we were. I think we've moved on a bit since then. But I put this slide up originally, the first people I showed it to, to just explain that this is what's actually going on with our expectations and how we feel about open data. And what we need to do is just get past that, just apply a little bit of a foot nudging, say, come on, let's, let's just move on and let's get on to the pragmatic approach. What can we do with this? We can do stuff with it. Of course we can. It's a resource. So what's that going to look like? What does that take to get us to the point where we're actually productive with open data and doing useful things with it? Now, Devon, the council, is one of the 16, I think it was, champions, exemplars named by Francis Maud, which was lovely. We had like a little wine reception with nibbles and stuff up at Whitehall, and that was lovely too. And uh, our lead member, portfolio <coughs> holder for information, came up and he was jolly impressed, and it was, it was nice. And that, that group, those 16, and we've got another member sitting in the audience there, Jamie, um, we're a bit of a gang, really, aren't we? We uh, sort of open data leads and open data people from various councils, and we get together and we talk a lot. And we do, uh, we did open data camp last year, and it's just coming up again this year. Is it next weekend or weekend after? Tenth. Tenth. And it's in Manchester. In Manchester, thank you. Really good. Plug in my you got to you got to plug yeah, it, mate. I, I saw Mark Bragan said you had to. It was <laughs> yeah. contractual Honestly, obligation. Yeah, yeah. So you should totally go if you can because it's amazing. Um, so we do a lot of stuff together. And we're a very supportive group, and and we all are very conscious of our status, and it's it's wonderful. But trouble is, is that I stand up in front of you here and say, yes, Devon County Councilman is a champion, open data, whatever. And you all expect me to have the winning formula. And I don't think there is one. 
And I think that if I stood here and said, yes, Devon are winners at open data, that I'd be lying, I'd be a bit of a fraud. We're not winning, but what we are doing is getting on with stuff and seeing what works. And I checked this and I had a quick chat with the cabinet office when they were talking about they were going to do this thing and just said, look, we haven't got a data store yet. We haven't got like hundreds of data sets published. We haven't done awesome things yet with open data. I think we're on this list just purely because of our attitude. And they went, yeah, yeah, that's about right, actually. That's pretty much it. Because our attitude is, let's try something. Let's make it really quick. Let's make it really cheap. See if it works. If it fails, we'll just quietly bury it and move on. If it works, we'll build on it a little bit more, and then we'll give it to somebody to develop. We won't be precious about it. We'll just get on. We'll just see what happens. And this next one, this again was her presentation for our, my leadership group, corporate leadership team, because um, they're not very technical people, and they needed a quick visual that just said, what, are we, what have we done around open data, and why have we been decided that we're champions? And as you can see, it's all quite bitty. The stuff that we actually did as we worked our way around, we were already quite good. We had a strategic intelligence function who was working on joint strategic needs assessment and a facts and figures page with a lot of data about the county. And um, we got a little bit of funding from the LGA, and we used it to do a couple of hackathons with the local hack society at Plymouth University. Um, we did some work on our community directory. We used some of the funding to get some training from the Open Data Institute, which was fantastic because it really kick-started our actual technical, let's build some stuff and publish some data. Um, we founded Open Data Forum. We joined the Open Data Leads Group, which was brilliant. And then we decided that we thought we would quite like to have a node, and we got that underway. So you can see it's, it's bits and bobs and small projects just to see what would work. And that's what's got us to where we are. And the good thing about doing little bits and bobs projects is it teaches you as much about what doesn't work as about what does, which is incredibly helpful. And that's hopefully some of the lessons I hope to be able to share today about the stuff we tried and what happened and what didn't happen. I'm going to take some water now and breathe a bit. So one of the things that we learned was that, and this is in the words of one of the people responsible for setting up data.gov.uk, which is the, the central government data store, if you build it, they won't come. Just because you build a lovely data store and fill it doesn't necessarily mean people are just going to show up in droves to come get your data. You have to work out what it is that they want. And we tried this exercise where we used some, the user stories, kind of, was it Giles, you mentioned user stories? Yeah. So that's what a user story looks like. Um, it's, it's a tried and tested method in, in software development that if you have basically a story that says this person needs this thing so they can do this job. So Bob needs a blue button so that he can click it to say that he's entered the receipt. Um, Sheila needs a new screen so that she can see whether or not Bob's finished doing all the receipts and so on and so forth. And each feature has a story attached. And we thought that what we might try doing to, to crowdsource that information about the sorts of data people wanted and what they wanted it for was to build up a library of user stories. We got a few, we got a few examples here, but actually it didn't get us much further forward because after the initial flurry of interest, I think we had like 20, 30 people who contributed something, we just had this handful of stuff and you step back and you go, well, yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of obvious, isn't it? Of course people need guidance. Of course people need tools so that they can visualize. Of course they need stuff to structure their data. What people aren't really telling us is what data do they want? And this was really interesting. Then we got out and we talked to, um, there was a local developers conference called DigPen, which was held down in Plymouth. It's about a year and a half ago. We went along to that. And my colleague and I, we gave this a little talk about, you know, we're really excited. We're setting up a data store. What would you like? And we said, what data would you like? And they said, what data have you got? And we said, well, we asked you first, damn it. <laughs> that's, that's not how it's supposed to work. But every time we have that conversation, that's how it goes. What do you want? What have you got? Every single time. So there's something there about not just going out and saying, yeah, you can have anything you want. What would you like? It's about saying, this is what we have. Will this do? And then start that conversation. And the other interesting thing about user stories is that they're great at exposing. You don't really have a useful function for what it is you want to do. Most of the people I work with um, are all good people. Of course they are, otherwise they wouldn't be working in public services. 
But if you say, well, you need to open up your data set, they're like, well, yeah, but it's not in my job description. My manager says it's not a priority. I'm too busy. The data's not ready. Uh, and what was the, my favourite excuse? Um, it hasn't been seen by committee yet. <laughs> hasn't been signed off yet. So that's okay. Fair enough. That's a good reason. I, I can't go around pushing people to do stuff they haven't got the resource or the patience or the skills to do. We've got to think about, firstly, making this a thing that everybody just does because it's the right thing to do. So I've come up with three good reasons why in local government we should do these things. Again, I like to keep it simple. So transparency, obviously. Uh, transparency is a reason. You should do transparency because transparency. Because why wouldn't you? Because if you have that data, you should probably just share it. It's just a thing you should do. Saying that you, you don't agree with transparency is like saying you hate puppies and sunshine. You know, you just, you'd worry about that person, wouldn't you? Why? Unfortunately, puppies and sunshine don't make much of a business case. So we'll put that there for now. The next reason is community. And this is an important one because we are looking at a lot of work to do and not enough money to do it with. So we're looking at what can we divest, what can we devolve, what can we pass out to other people to do. And for some of that stuff, we've got to pass out some of the resources for them to do it with. Information is one of those resources. And if we can't give people funding attached to running a service or running an asset, one thing we can do is give them the information. So Devon has got a, a communities web page, which I'm just in the middle of viewing at the moment. <coughs> one of the things that we decided we would do was we would tell people where all the actual physical assets are that we've got. So not just the, the library buildings and the office buildings and so on, but every sort of scrubby patch of land, every depot that's not currently used, everything. And just say, here's, here's the list as an open data set, as CSV file of everything that we have, where it is, uh, and crucially, how much it costs to run, how much its staffing costs were for the last year we've got complete data for, um, and what maintenance needs doing. So then anybody that was <coughs> thinking about, well, maybe I'd like to take that building and I want to run a, a youth club out of it, could take a look at our old data and say, oh, my God, you know, the roof needs doing, the electrics haven't been done since 1963, and um, it costs 100,000 a year just to, just to keep it turning over. Maybe I won't go for that one. Maybe I'll look at the next building on the list. So they've got that information to make informed choices. So community is a good reason, in it, and it does build a business case to actually get a data set out and say someone can do something useful with that. That means we can then save some money and make some efficiency savings somewhere. <coughs> Excuse me. Just matter the mic. <coughs> and finally, intelligence. Intelligence is, is the biggest business case. If our data is good enough to be put out, it's structured, it's cleaned, and it's good enough to publish, then it's good enough just to share with our colleagues as well. It's so much easier to find, so much faster to find. It's easier and it's faster than to share with our partners, with public sector partners, and to put out to anybody who can do something useful with it. So intelligence is, for me, is the biggest reason for getting our data in the right state, because we benefit. We're the first customer for our own open data because it just makes it so much more straightforward for us to do our jobs as analysts, as commissioners, as, as whatever role we have, to know what's going on within the council, to know what we have, to know where services are going. And of course, performance. I'm just going to gently make fun of some local gov people again here for a moment. Performance, we know how to do that, don't we? <laughs> Very concerned about how my local council's performing against its key strategic performance indicators said no resident ever. <laughs> but this is what we do to them. We say, yes, we know performance is basically is taking all of our data and putting it out there. And our key strategic performance indicators, well, that's those, and this is how we're doing. And there you go, consider yourself informed. Job done. And some councils and other bodies have got this sorted. The data goes into a database, and it's tidied up, and it's cleaned up and structured. And then you can get it out in any format that you want. So you can have pretty infographics and gauges and dials and charts or just you know, CSV files and spreadsheets if you want to, if you've got it in the right state and format to start with. But what tends to happen is that we look at the councils who've really got their act together when it concerns their data. And we say, well, they're really well managed. Their budget's really well managed. They themselves know what's going on. They've got good community action going on and they've got a cool dashboard. So what we need is a cool dashboard. And then we'll be as good as them. And so we take this massive bucket of data, 
Can we pile it into the top of the old dashboard machine? Boom, 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 out it comes. And whatever drops out, we call that information. We stick it in a dashboard. And we say, there you go. There's all the information you could possibly need. And this is, this is exactly strategic performance indicators all over again, except now it's pretty. Um, and it's not, that's not a dashboard. It's just, that's a presentation layer. It's only as good as the data behind it. And if you haven't given any thought to what it was that people wanted to know or needed to know to get a particular job done or get the particular question answered, then this is, is wasted effort. It's meaningless. It looks like you're doing stuff, but really, you haven't helped anybody get any further forward. So that is, it's like a cargo cult. Dashboard is not the answer. Good data, good data structure, good data management is the thing that you need. And then you will get great dashboards because in the course of that, you'll have talked to people about what they need to know, and that's what you show people. <coughs> so how do you find out what matters? And how do you find out what's useful? You need to get out more. You need to get out, you need to get out and talk to people you don't normally talk to. You need to just have honest conversations about what it is they need to know and what it is they need to do. So rather than go out and say, what data do you want? You find out what job it is they've got to do, what problem it is they've got to solve. And we started with our scrutiny committees that we didn't usually get to talk to because they're members and we're, you know, working down in the bowels of the building somewhere. We actually went out and talked to them and said, look, this is what you usually get. This is the kind of presentation we think you might like. What do you think? They hated it, which was brilliant, and they gave us about 100 ideas for improving that particular layout and format. And we kept going back and talking to them about what it was they hated and what they loved and what was useful until we ended up with a presentation of stats that they really, really like, really find useful. So getting out more is key. Go further than that, get out of the building. Not only out from behind your desk, not only up to the committee suite, but right out of the building and talk to people outside the council. So yeah, talk to developers, talk to people in the street, talk to other councils, talk to police and fire and rescue data people, get out, go to conferences, unconferences, and make friends. Make, making friends is the biggest thing. Devon couldn't do half of what it does at the moment if it weren't for the, the quality and the breadth of, of connections that we've made just from sending our people out to talk to different people and find out what it is they know and what they need that we don't know about. And by far the biggest, for God's sake, make friends with IT. I didn't. I didn't, and it was a huge mistake, and I've had to do a great deal of backpedaling. If you, don't, if, you're, if you haven't got IT people on your team, and open data shouldn't be a, an IT project because it's not an IT thing, it's an information thing. But if you haven't got IT people involved, you're not talking to them, you haven't made friends, then you don't know, firstly, what you're doing that's causing them major problems and getting in their way, messing with their security setup, and they don't know what they've got that you might be able to use, what tools, what are the corporate tools that you could be taking advantage of? You think that you're doing it all on your own, but actually they've got something that would do that job. They've got somebody with a few hours capacity who could help you build something. So if you do one thing, make friends with IT. Absolutely. And I'm coming to the end of, of this thing, so I think I had like four things that I wanted to make sure I've made the point. So the first is get out of the building. The second is make friends. The third is get your data in order and ready, and good quality. And, and the fourth is find out what matters. Those are four things. Like if there was a winning formula, they'd be high on, on that. So that's the end of that. And I'm open to questions. I drink some more water. Just love the graphics, Lucy. <laughs> superb, Thank absolutely you. superb. Any questions for Lucy on that? That was wonderful. That's uh, Devon's journey through open data. Yes, uh, young lady at the back. How much of the audience have you found it? Um, stuff Actually, we are doing a, the project with FutureGov. I don't know if you've come across them. They had some funding, which made things much easier. And what we found was that they, they've done this sort of thing before. They're not amateurs. So they came down and held um, a scoping meeting with all of the decision makers actually in the room. So the, the port portfolio holder for social care services, the um, head of service, and the data manager, plus several cr crucial members of the data analysis team, to actually find out what was possible, as well as, I think, a couple of frontline people, and went round and scoped it out and said, what would be a useful thing to do? 
before they started talking about what data have you got, the first thing was actually what would be a useful thing to do with open data around social care. So that, that's definitely a winning formula, is get the right people in the room at the beginning and make sure they understand that there's a useful product coming out of it and it's not just some airy-fairy um, theoretical exercise. So I've probably got more information about that. If you'd be interested, we could uh, exchange emails and send you what I've got. Very good. Any other questions for Lucy? No? Well, thank you very much indeed, Lucy. And thanks for coming up and sharing that with us. Wonderful. Thank you.